Before we, uh, before we jump into the, into the scriptures, I know this, is, uh, this, is, this stage belongs to Jesus. This is his place, and this is a place where we, we lift up the name of Jesus and Jesus only. Uh, but I would like to do something. Um, <clears throat> lately, I, I've kind of been hammering this point of, of, of serving the Lord. I made a big point of it last week, and, and it's important that we serve the Lord. You know, the Bible says to let the Spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. And so in, in order to, to be excited about the things of God, uh, part of that equation is you have to serve God. Okay, There's, you got to serve the Lord in some way for Him to excite you about who He is and His Word and His kingdom and His church, right? you got to get excited about it. And so I would, uh, I would just like to, to take a moment uh, to, to recognize some folks, you know, this, since this church started uh, almost six years ago, there's been some that have been just steady serving, 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 serving. You know who you are. None of you do it for praise, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. That's awesome. Um, but I, w- I, would like to, I would like to acknowledge uh, tonight um, Jessica and Ben. And um, so here's the... Th- you know, the, the, the Bible tells us that every one of us is given a, a spiritual gift to build up the body of Christ, right? And I just want to let you know, the both of you, that um, not just like right now, but often, this is like one night of many that, that I feel very built up and encouraged because of what you do. And so I just wanted to, uh, to thank you, and I, I think we all could do that probably again. It would be all right, you know? Thank you for what you do. <clears throat> awesome. Well, um, why don't you do me a favor and uh, why don't we grab a copy of God's Word and uh, turn to the book of Ephesians. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them here. There's blue ones all over the place. Uh, don't shortchange yourself. Grab a copy and, and put your eyes on it and, and, and learn and grow and and, and I just want to say as your pastor, I, I'd love to see that this, that this series really makes, um, makes a difference in your life. I, I, I was laying in bed this morning about five, I think it was, about five o'clock, and I was talking to Meredith, and, and I said, you know, if, if I could just have like one thing, if I could have one gift from God, it would be this, and it's, it's, it's layman's terms, but please hear me on this is that, that during this series that you, you would just get it? Do, do you know what I mean by that? Like, not just understand it, but like you'd, you'd, you'd catch fire. Something would happen. I'm, I'm excited about the, the book of Ephesians because uh, I've read it many times, but over the last year and a half of him whispering in my ear, Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians. I was like, okay, fine. You know, I'm just trying to follow that, you know? And, and so finally here we are, but, but I'm excited about it because even though I've read it many times in the past, having spent a lot of time in it the last couple of weeks, really, um, I'm excited because I, I know that God's Word says that, that it always accomplishes what it sets out to do. And, and having read this book now cover to cover, if you will, several times over the last uh, probably three weeks, Man, I'm just excited because if his word accomplishes what it sets out to do, then I'm excited to see what's going to happen in your lives individually and in our life as a church as a result of spending time in this book. I'm excited. I re- I'm, I'm very excited about it. You know, Maybe I'm a, uh, and Michael, this is your chance, right? I'm a Bible nerd. Nothing? No amen? Nothing? I set it up for you. Yes, you are. I mean, just something. Don't let me down. Thanks. Nerd. Bible nerd. But I am. I'm excited. I, I'm excited because I, I honestly, I, you, listen, call, call me crazy. I honestly believe that you guys will read this book and, and you will take it and embrace it and live it and it's going to change you. I believe that. And I believe that you, that you are, there's a section and I think it's um, Acts 17 where it talks about the uh, people in Thessalonica and the people in Berea. And the people in Berea, it says, were more open-minded, and they listened to the apostles preaching. 
Every day they listened to the guys who were like, not just me studying the apostles' words and giving it to you. These were the guys that were hearing from God, were with Jesus, and, and they were teaching the people, but still, the Bereans still, because they, they wanted to know the truth. You want to know the truth? Anyone here want to know the truth, right? Yeah. They studied what the preacher was saying. It says it in the Bible that they went and they checked every day the scriptures to see if the dude with the microphone, if you will, actually was telling the truth. Okay, if I get up here for an hour, are you going to remember everything I said? No, I right Amen. <laughs> Listen, I, in order for God's word to not return void, for it to accomplish what it's supposed to do. You got to take some notes and you got to go home like the Bereans did and you have to check and see what, what I'm telling you lines up with the book. I want to see you get it. I want to be a church that's on fire for the Lord and the only way you're going to be on fire is if that word gets written on your heart. You, got, you can't just listen and go home. You, you want a notebook, don't you? Yeah. Listen. Sit, 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 sit. She's got, I love that. I love that. I love, you got a notebook. I love it. Get up here and preach, girl. <laughs> we're, look, we're investing in you right now. This is, a, this is a huge investment. These are like 60 cents a piece. Somewhere around there. How much? 88 Forget it. Listen, 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 listen. Right. Don't waste it, right? Amen. Right. Listen, I, wanna, I, want, I want you to, if you're going to take a notebook, use it. Use it. Who wants one? Come here, Michael. Would you pass these out for me, brother? You raised your hand first. Yeah, good. He gets to hand out pens. <laughs> listen, if you want a notebook, please take some notes. Listen. Take some notes, go home during the week and look at some of this stuff and, and compare it to the scriptures. And I, listen, I'm not, I'm not God. I've been wrong lots of times. And if, I, if you read something and I've preached something and it doesn't seem to jive, everyone here knows my phone number. Let's talk. Let's, get to, let's reason together. Let's find out the truth so we can live the truth. Amen? Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to give you a minute to, to grab your notebook and, and label it Ephesians, united in Christ. Your love is extravagant. I don't know who was singing in the back there, but that was good, right? You go, girl. A little cross-room harmony thing going there. That was good, right? That was good. All right. If you don't know how to spell Ephesians, it's because you're not holding your Bible out in front of you. That's, our, that's, that's strike one. <laughs> yeah, E-F. <laughs> All right, Listen. You guys ready to get to work? I'm good. I got a, I got a pen. I already took my notes. I already took my notes. And you put your pens on top of my notes. Okay, so, so listen. Here's the deal with the book of Ephesians. When, when Paul wrote the book, right, he knew the people in Ephesus, and the people in Ephesus knew him, right? So he was writing to them. He, he had some form of a relationship with them. And so when he writes the letter to them, they could understand the context, what he was writing about and who he was writing to. And, and they knew him and he knew them and all that, right? But you don't. And, and so to, to, to just open up the book of Ephesians and just start reading through and go, oh, okay, I got it. I got it. No, I, I don't think that you're going you're gonna to get the content until you get the context, right? So you want to get the context first. So let's I want to take a little bit to, to explain to you a little bit about um, some history and a, and a little bit about Ephesus and Paul and all that kind of stuff. A little history, a little, uh, some fact finding about the book of Ephesians, okay? So let's start here. Uh, the book, uh, I'm sorry, the, the church in Ephesus, this town, this, this group of believers was planted in, in AD 53. Okay, so, so that's, that's sort of significant in that 
I'm, I'm, I'm 47 years old, okay? So j- that's practically the same time, right? Who, anyone in here 53 years old? Yeah, <laughs> Hannah, right? Yeah. Two liars. So for the new people, welcome. Um, so, <laughs> my Lord. So, so in, in, in just basically in my short life, right, this church followed the, the you two sitting next to it, it might not work because you guys love to chat. And I'm, I'm ADD, so like, okay, perfect. Be his monitor back there, all right? You be his monitor. We'll Shh, be, listen, we'll be okay, awesome, 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 okay. I know, shh, shh, I can't talk when you're talking. Thank you. <clears throat> In my short life was when the church of Ephesus was planted from Jesus' ministry, life, death, and resurrection. This was not some church that was planted you know, 500 years later, 1,000 years later, 2,000 years later. This was on the heel. Like, this is not that long ago when they planted the church from when this was all happening. Like, I remember when I was in high school, it was like yesterday, right? And this is what's going on here. This church gets planted like right when this was happening. It wasn't like some hearsay that they were planting this church. This was on the heels of, of Jesus' ministry, on the direct heels of the church beginning, uh, which is described in Acts chapter 2 when, at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls and, and begins the church. Okay, so, so now some uh, seven years later, after Paul had spent time planting this church, um, in A.D. 60, he writes this letter back to these people from, this will preach, from a Roman prison cell. And, and so he is, he is encouraging these free people while he's in captivity. Th- that'll preach, right? Because he didn't let the circum. this might just be what you need, he didn't let the circumstances of his life affect his faith. Right, And so he just stood strong. And even though he's in the prison cell, he is writing back to these people that he planted this church and he loved these people. Now, the Bible says that he wrote this letter and he gave it to this guy, Tychicus. Now, I don't, not much is known about this Tychicus fella, um, but he writes this letter to, to, to Ephesus and he gives it to Te- Tychicus to deliver it to them. Now, uh, um, historians believe that, that there's a solid chance that this letter wasn't just written just to the church at Ephesus, but it was written to the church is around that area. It was what we would call a circular letter. And Paul would write this, and they would be delivered to this church, and then after you read it to your congregation, you'd give it to her, and she would read it to her congregation, and so on and so forth, because most of the ancient manuscripts don't say that it was written to Ephesus, it was written to God's holy people who are faithful followers of Christ, and that was it. But it was given to Tychicus to give to the Ephesians first. Now, um, we also know that Paul loved this church. And it was quite apparent that he loved them because this traveling man, much of his ministry, as you probably know, this Apostle Paul, he traveled from place to place to place, planting churches, appointing leaders, spreading the gospel to communities that hadn't heard the good news of Jesus yet. But yet, even though he was called to to travel all the time, this man Paul settled in and preached himself at this church for over two and a half years. Uh, he did most of his preaching at this, uh, this building called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus. Now, this guy Tyrannus, too, I don't know much about him either. There's not much about him. But I know, like, Tyrannus and Ty- they're, like, really awesome names. So, like, if I was ever to have a, a, another boy, I think that would be, those are, like, cage fighter names. This is my son, Tychicus. You know what I mean? It's a good name. Uh, But we don't know much about this guy, but what happened was when Paul first went to Ephesus, he preached in the synagogue. He would go to a place like this, and he would preach the good news of Jesus to the Jewish people. And some people received the good news, amen, and some people didn't. It's like that still, right? Well, there was some controversy there, and there was some squabbling within that little church, that little temple, and so Paul left that temple, and he didn't preach there anymore. But what he did do is he went to this lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now the deal with the lecture hall, we don't, we don't know a whole lot about this particular lecture hall, if you will, but there's a couple of things we do know. We do know that it was sort of a big place. Now th- this, this guy Paul would, would go to, to this lecture hall and, and he would preach where there were people. 
He would go to these places that were, that were built. They were large scale. I don't know if you, can you put up the next picture? This, this next picture is, is what was commonly seen in that culture back then. Back then, they would build these large amphitheaters, and they were outdoors, and, and they build them for, for the acoustics were perfect. And someone would stand down here, and you didn't need this. You just spoke, and it would just carry up over the crowd. And, and we know that it was large um, because, because these people would go there all the time, like um, philosophers, politicians, intellectuals, poets, and they would stand there, and great crowds would gather, and they would just stand up in front of all these people and just wax eloquently about whatever topic they were a so-called expert, and they would just stand and do that. that. That was the norm back then. This is what they did. They didn't have the phones, and they didn't have Netflix, and Redbox, and the movie theater, and, you know, and Disneyland, and Las Vegas shows. They didn't have all that. They would stand, they would sit in these seats, and one person would stand and talk. And great crowds would come and they would listen. And Paul, being taking serious this commission to go to the ends of the earth, and in, in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you'll be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Paul took that call seriously. He's like, if we're going to get the, this good news to the ends of the earth, we better get to some people. So he would go to where the people would gather and he began to preach the good news of Jesus to the crowds. Now the reason why we know it was a large place is because this was standard operating procedure as far as building them. But we also know this. In Acts 19.10, and I don't like the New Living Translation on this one. It's kind of weak. But if you look at most of the other translations, if not all, in Acts um, 19, was it 19.10, it says this. As a result of Paul's preaching at the lecture hall of of Tyrannus, all, all, all the people in Asia heard the word of the Lord. All. Some would say all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord. So we know there's no way that gets done, right? There was 300,000 people in Ephesus alone. So if all the people in Asia were to hear the word of the Lord as a result of this dude's preaching, do you, can you, is it safe to assume that it wasn't some down like this little enclave down here in this cul-de-sac in this little house where, where no one could get to, a little gathering place where you could put 10, 12 people? No, not if all the people in Asia heard the word of the Lord. There must have been a pretty decent sized gathering place, but he would go to places like that, and he would preach. He took the, the call seriously. Now, in today's world, we don't see a whole lot of that anymore. You know, we've got all this entertainment at our, foot, at our, at our fingertips now. We can, we can get entertained just like this on our phones and TV and computer, and we can go places and all that. So there's not a whole lot of this standing in a room and, and speaking about something. In, in today's world, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of these TED Talks. Have you ever heard of TED Talks? There's these TED conferences. There were uh, technology, entertainment, and design. And, and people, their, 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 their slogan was, uh, well, I wrote it down, I can't remember what it was, uh, ideas worth spreading. That's what they would do. So some man would stand up, and they, they have these conferences worldwide now. They're all over the place. And someone would stand up, and in their area of expertise, they would just stand on the stage, and you're, I think you're given 18 minutes. And you just speak on this topic, and people come by the thousands, and you just listen to these experts speak in their field. So there's a little bit about there's a little bit of that going on now. They they started with just technology, entertainment, and design. They've kind of branched off now, and they've included science, culture, and academics in their discussions. But it's sort of similar to what Paul did at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now we also know that um, Ephesus was a major city. it was populated with about 300,000 people. Uh, it was of major importance to all the nations surrounding the Mediterranean Sea where it is. If you could take a peek here, see the little red dot? And see, that's Ephesus. And so you can see that it's very, very important because all the nations around it uh, would utilize that port for trade and supplies and stuff. Down below the Mediterranean Sea, you got the great nation of Egypt and all the nations down here and all their stuff coming up the Nile River into the Mediterranean Sea to bring trade to all these different places. You've got over to the right, you've got Israel and all the Middle East right there. Above it where Ephesus is, that little piece of land coming out, it's not so little. That was what was called Asia Minor. It's what's today modern-day Turkey and all those great cities there and all the 
ports along that coast were very, very huge and busy. Of course, just to the left of the, uh, of the, of the city of Ephesus, the next piece of land coming down was, was Greece. I mean, a metropolis, just tons of people and trade and education and philosophy and intellect and arts and all that. And then, of course, to the left of that was, was Rome. And, and of course, during this time, the Roman Empire spread all around here. So you've got just thousands and thousands, hundreds and th- hundreds of thousands of people, and they're all going through the Mediterranean Sea and all these great nations. And right there in the middle of it was this great seaport, Ephesus. And so Paul would, would go there, and he, you could see his missionary journeys. If you look into a Bible, look at all the maps. But he would go to these places, and he would plant churches. And, and when the church first started in Jerusalem, there was a little bit of, a, of, a, of, of dispersing. You know, there was some persecution. So people were getting saved, and Jewish people didn't really like it. And so people were going off into other places. And fanned by this persecution, the gospel would begin to spread across the known world. And people don't like persecution, but God uses it to spread his kingdom. And so we shouldn't be afraid of it, but that's a whole other story. Uh, Ephesus was also a very important, important city in the, in the uh, Roman Empire uh, because it was the, uh, the home of the temple of the Greek goddess Artemis. And uh, kind of a weird, she's got a weird resume, this false god. She's the goddess of chastity, which means just refraining from sexual activity altogether. I mean, how do you pray to that? I don't know. She's also the goddess of virginity. But then again, she's also the goddess of the hunt, the moon, and nature. It's kind of a weird resume, this, this Artemis chick. Uh, she was believed to be the daughter of Zeus. Now we're going to hear more about this Greek goddess Artemis as we go forward in the series in the weeks to come, but we'll, we'll hear more. But it was a very important city because her temple was there. Now, we also know that this is a very precious, precious city and a strategic city for the gospel, so much so that Paul, after leaving there, he actually personally appointed his very own uh, protege, Timothy, which two b- books of the Bible are written to him, right? Paul wrote to this guy. He was his student, and he personally appointed Timothy to be the pastor of that church, so it was a very important church to him, and he knew that for, the, for, for Christianity to spread across the known world, to, to the ends of the earth, Ephesus was crucial. That was an anchor city for the gospel. And so he appointed Timothy there. And it's amazing because of all the things that he told Timothy, to be a good pastor, 2 Timothy 4, 2, he says, listen, I want you to, to patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage God's people by preaching God's word. That's what he told them. And, and, and it's because that's what people need to hear. It, it's a constant in a, in a sea of change, and it's a standard, a truth standard that, that spans the generation and does not change. And, and I, was, I was at this point in my, in my preparation this week, and, and as I was studying and writing down my notes, uh, I was reminded right here uh, of, of how thankful I am uh, for you guys, because it's been like six years now, and, and virtually every week I, I, I'm, I get up here and I don't have any high-sounding philosophy, and I'm not the smartest dude in the world, and I don't have an amazing control of the English language, and I'm not using a bunch of creative stuff. I just get up, and I'm just like, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, and I just feel like this is the precedent, that it's okay, that that's what I'm doing, and I just want to do that. that. I feel like that's the best thing that I could serve up a, a parched soul, and that is... God's word, and so I want to continue that, but I just want to thank you guys for letting me, letting me do that. Um, if the book of Ephesians is, is a little bit unlike some of his other letters. It's not uh, like 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is rebuking the church, like they are misbehaving on a on hundred different levels, and Paul's like, yeah, this is wrong, and don't do that, do this. Quit it. Stop. And he's hammering these people on their behavior, but, but Ephesians is not, is not like that at all. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, just a, it's just an encouraging letter. And, and he's encouraging them, a church that's doing well. He, he's talking to faithful followers of Christ, and he's encouraging them so they can grow even more. And so they can be more effective in the community, in the area of the world, where they could spread the gospel with greater impact, how they could draw together in, in greater unity and love, and to spread 
the kingdom more and to enjoy God more, to just reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And I believe because of that, that it's a very, very appropriate letter for this church. You know, it was just a, what, a couple weeks ago or last week? I don't even remember what, I guess it was last week, where I talked about um, Ephesus, about how it was a good church. And, and in Revelation, God says, it's a good church, and you patiently endured, and you, you, you hung in there, and you, and you kept on keeping on, and you were good. But, but you kind of got a little sideways. You've lost your first of all love. And listen, we're, I'm prone to that too, right? I'm, I'm not just accusing you guys. We all get that way sometimes. We're a good church. You guys are a good church. But, but sometimes, I mean, if truth be known, some of us get a little bit off course. And, and, and worshiping God and, and serving God and giving to God and, and loving God and praying to God, right? Those aren't the priority of your life sometimes. I mean, we all can admit that. I, I know we can. I, I'm like that. Sometimes I get distracted with other stuff. And so his call was, hey, listen, you guys are a good church. But you just got to get back on track. Love, the, love me with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and love those people. Let's get back on track. So I think that's us. And so I think that this letter is absolutely to us. See, you know, it's, it's written, it's kind of like a to and from, a, a to and from letter. You know, it's like uh, from Paul, uh, appointed by the will of God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Spread the good news to you guys, uh, to God's holy people who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. I think that's written to us. I do. I think it's written to us. So if that's the case, if this is written to us, then I would just encourage you again like I did last week, anyone with ears to hear should listen to the Spirit and to understand what the Spirit is saying to this church. Embrace it. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I pray that that would be you guys during this, I don't know, three, four, five, six, eight months. I don't know how long it's going to take. So that's the context. That's Ephesus, and that's the book of Ephesians. But before we get into the content of it, I'd like to pray with you. Okay? I'd like to pray with you. Because I want this to be a profitable time for you. Help us, Father, to be rid of distraction right now. Help us sense the importance of what we're doing here. Help us to understand who our true teacher is, Almighty God. Help us to worship you with a holy fear and awe. We understand, Lord, that our ways are not your ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Even as the heavens are above the earth, so are your thoughts and ways above ours. We cannot, on our own, comprehend the truths that are in this book. But you told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we have been given at salvation the mind of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to exercise this new mind and to see things from your perspective. Lord, give us ears to hear you. Sometimes we need to get quiet and hear beyond the voice of the messenger to hear your message. Help us with that. And give us eyes to see our own deficiencies as we look into the mirror of God's Word. And help us to have the desire now because we want to fight you, Lord. It is in our nature to fight you, Lord, so please give us the desire now to align our life with your word. We ask these things in the name of your good son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So I started studying this book, and there's all kinds of good stuff in here, and we're going to study a lot of it. But as I started to read it weeks ago, I noticed something. In the first three chapters, and there's tons of stuff in the first three chapters, but in the first three chapters, under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, Paul pens something 
six times. He repeats himself six times, this one statement. Now, we're only going to study five of them. We're only going to look at five of them because the sixth is, it would take you three weeks to study it, so I'm not going to do that to you tonight. But, but, but he says this thing six times. Now, why would, he, why would God want to say something six times in three chapters? Like, why? Is it because he, 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 he's, he's, you know, he's, he's sort of old, isn't he? I mean, he's been around. Maybe he forgot some stuff. Anyone think that? Because if you say yes, I want to step away before the lightning comes. Right? It's, it's not that he forgot stuff. He's not getting senile. He doesn't have dementia or nothing. Right? He just, right? I, I think, I'm just me, I think it's just he's trying to make a point. Right? I think that's, you know, he repeats himself over and over again. So you get it. Right? And so this is what he says six times in three chapters. And it's the title of our message series. Because we are united with Christ. Because we are united with Christ. Now, a lot of the preaching that's been coming from this microphone over the last couple months has been about this, hasn't it? This is nothing new. This is nothing new at all. As a matter of fact, the truth that's found in the Scripture is nothing new at all, but maybe it's new to you. Maybe it's new to you. Maybe you need to understand what it means to be united with Christ. And I would like for you to understand the truth of who you really are. And I'd like for you to understand and experience the oneness that Christ wants with you. And I want you to understand the benefits of this reality of being united with Christ. Do you know what united really means? I don't want to just throw that word out. The word united means to be joined into a single entity. One. Joined into a single entity. And so I want to read through some of these sections that talk about some of the benefits of who you are and, and, some, and some, reap the benefit of this oneness with Christ. So, so let's just start right here. It's, it's in chapter 1, verse 3. I want you to understand this, this reality, of some, some new realities. <clears throat> reality to me, and I don't know about you, but reality to me means what I see. Did you ever hear someone quote something out of the Bible? They read a story out of the Bible, but then they, they say this. But the reality is, never, anyone ever hear that? That drives me crazy. They, 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 they say, they read the Bible, but then they say, but the reality is this. And then they start telling you about real life. And I'm here to tell you that, that what's in this book is real life. And, and I need you to understand, if we're going to change, if we're going to be different, if we're going to be a, a powerhouse in our world, we have to understand a new reality, that sometimes reality is not just what we can see. I want you to have a new reality. And so look here in, 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 in chapter 1, verse 3. Look what it says. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Here's our sentence. Here's our little here, a little, whatever you want to call it, section of sentence. Because we are united with Christ. Now, I, I don't want to stand up before you and, and be uh, arrogant or foolish and, and, and somehow tell you that I'm going to give you a comprehensive list of every spiritual blessing that he's given you. Like, I, if I started writing them down from the moment I was like one till, till the day I died, it, I wouldn't even come close to be able to list them, right? No one could. But, but what I can do is I can give you a, a, a short list of the spiritual blessings that are right here in this context that, he, that Paul lists for us right here. Now remember, the reality is to us usually what we can see and taste and hear and touch, right? Things that are real, right? So what Paul wants to do is he wants to give you a new reality. Now, now look what it says here. The, the, the spirit, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. We need to see some things we, that we didn't see before. Look in verse 4. Here's right in context. Even before he made the world. Did you ever read Genesis 1? That's all right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Can anyone explain that to me? Because I can't. What's the beginning? I don't even know. 
I think linear. I, I have no idea. I'm a timeline guy. I, have no, I can't think beyond that, right? But there was some day, way, 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 way back, and there was nothing except God. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the chaos. There was just nothing. Before that happened, before he said, let there be light, he loved you. I think maybe some of us in this room can, can comprehend the fact that he lo- like God so loved the world that he sent his son. Like right here and now, like me, I'm a sinner, I'm no good, but he loves me. Some of us get that. Some of us are still struggling through that, aren't we? But, but some of us get that, but I need you to have this reality. This is the, this is the heavenly realms. These are things you, you didn't really see. Before he made the earth, he loved you. And he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance. Like, when is that? Some way back there. To adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the gracious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Listen, loved ones. Before he said, let there be light, before there was a tree, before there was a Jupiter, before there was a Grand Canyon, before there was light, before there was water, before there was sky, he loved you, chose you, adopted you, freed you, and forgave you. These are things we don't see, but they're reality. And you have to understand that this is the case. This is true because you are united joined into single singularity with Christ. You are one, one thing because you're in Christ. This is true. He loved you. He chose you. He adopted you. He forgave you. And he also freed you from sin's power to control you. Do, do you know that sin has this ability, this may come as a surprise, an ability to make you do foolish things? And, and, and because because he loves you and because, because, because you're united with Christ, that sin's power to make you do stupid is dead. You don't have to do that anymore. You can say no to it. And it's also, the, the sin also has this power to, to cast you down into an eternal destiny of where you belong, which is an ugly place called hell because you're a sinner. You sinned against a perfect God. So here's truth in church, right? You didn't come for like this lovey-dovey message. The truth is we all deserve to be apart from him forever in a, in a destiny of, of a burning, tormented hell. Like that's what we get. We deserve to be punished because we've all been naughty. But, but, because he loved you and you're now united with Christ, sin's power to send you there is dead. Because you're in Christ. Do you get that reality? Do you get the reality? Someone say amen. Really? I mean, it's a big deal, right? If I brought to you a check right now, Publishers Clearinghouse, you want a million dollars. Would you give me an amen? amen? Who would give me an amen if I walked in at the Publishers Clearinghouse? <laughs> Listen, you just got greater than that. You just got greater than that. Can someone give me an amen? amen. Ah, come on now. You ready for the next one? A new reality. 111. Look at 111. Furthermore, like as in, if that's not enough, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. So that's the next one. We, we receive an inheritance. And again, I wouldn't be arrogant and foolish to tell you about that whole in- inheritance because I can't, I can't tell you what, what heaven's like. I can't tell you all the good things that are coming. Like, when you leave here, some, some things are coming that are going to be good. I don't know what they are. I can't tell you what they are. But he does say you're going to receive an inheritance. You know what's so cool about an inheritance? Who works here? Who has worked? 
Maybe you're retired, right? But you worked. You get what you work for, right? Yeah. In an ideal world. Everyone wants a raise. I get it. I'm in your, I'm in your fan club. I get it, right? right? But, but, but you, you get what you earn, right? And an inheritance, you get what you didn't earn, right? It's awesome. You, you get free stuff. Anyone like free stuff? Here's free stuff from God. Because, listen, there's nothing you, you, who went to the cross here? Anyone here go to the cross? I didn't go to the cross. Did you go to the cross? Did you go to the cross? I didn't go to the cross. But Jesus did. And because Jesus went to the cross and you're united with him, you get an inheritance. You get some freebies, right? And so let's look at the context. What do you get? What do you get? <clears throat> he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now, I'm not the greatest Bible student in the world, but he makes everything work out according to his plan. kind of has a ring to it. Does it sound like another verse in the Bible somewhere? Which one? What is it? Romans 8, 28, right? All things work together for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. This one doesn't say purpose. It says according to his plan. He's making things work out good. See, see, you have an advocate in heaven right now. He's praying for you to the Father. And you also, that's the Son, you also have the Holy Spirit of God that says that he is praying for you right now in perfect unity in accordance to God the Father's will on your behalf right now. Do you ever wonder why things kind of work out for you? That's your inheritance. That's God working things out for you. He's working things out for you right now. Right? Amen. Amen. Right? So that's one thing. Here's the second thing. Because it's right here in the text. I'm not making anything up. I'm just reading as it says. Uh, next, very next verse. God's purpose was that we Jews who were first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed, here comes part of this inheritance. And when you believed in Christ, like there was a moment when, you, when your heart bent to the lordship of Jesus, right? I hope that was you. I hope everyone in here has done this. At that moment, when you believed, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised. See, see, that's like the, the down payment, the earnest payment for the full inheritance of which I cannot describe to you. I don't know what's going to happen good in your life. I can't describe to you what heaven's going to look like or what you're going to do there. We can sit and talk about that all day long. Some of you think you're going to sit on clouds and play harps. Some of you think you're going to be mowing Billy Graham's lawn. I don't know what you're going to be doing. I don't know about the streets of gold. I don't know about pearly gates. I don't know about nothing. It might look like Willy Wonka land up there. I've never been. No idea. I have no idea, right? People speculate and argue and fight, and I know. You don't know. The Scripture said no one's gone to heaven and come back. No one. So nobody knows what it looks like except God himself. He's the one up there preparing a place. You ain't. So nobody knows. But good things are going to happen. And the moment that you said yes to Jesus, your inheritance began. And the first, the down payment for the full inheritance was the Holy Spirit of God. And that should be good enough. The Holy Spirit of God, that, that, that same spirit that, that, that was hovering over the chaos before anything was created, the same Holy Spirit that, is, that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Trinity. He's the one who convicts us of sin. He tells us of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. You know what that means? He says, listen, guys, you're a sinner, and you can't get right on your own no matter what you do. You can't get right. You will never be right with God in, in improvement or behavior modification. It'll never happen. But God's righteousness, that'll make it happen. And so he's the one who convicts us of these things. And then he says he convicts us of the coming judgment. So there's a sense of urgency. You're a sinner and you can't get right with God no matter what you do to help yourself. No behavior modification, no self-help, no, no Anthony Robbins, nothing. No Zig Ziglar's going to get you there. You, the only way to get better is with God's righteousness, his own son. And when he goes to the cross, he takes on your death and sin. And when you say yes to him, he gives you his perfection. And that's the only way to be right, and you better do it now. There's urgency from the Holy Spirit. He also get, uh, guides us in all truth. 
He gives us boldness to preach, brings us comfort in trials, gives us gifts to perform ministry, and he prays, as I said before, in perfect unity with the Father's will on your behalf. And it's all because you are united with Christ. Amen. Here's the, here's the third one. I'll look in chapter 2, starting in verse 4. I'm going to say that because you unite in Christ, not only are you saved, but you're skyboxed. Let me read the text here. But God is so rich in mercy and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, that's kind of harsh language there, right? Dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So we've been saved, that's good. But the claim was that you've been skyboxed. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So who's ever been to a, a sporting event like the Magic or some big professional event, right? You know what skyboxes are? Now the rest of us little folks, we sit in these seats, right? But the privileged p people, they sit up top. They sit up high where they drink champagne and eat caviar and steak and lobster tail during a Magic game. I used to go to the Celtic game. We sit in $4 obstructed view seats. You had to sit and there was a column, a cement pillar like this. You got to watch half-court ball games. And the, the floor was so covered in spit and beer, it was... Every time you walk through the hallways of the Boston Garden, and Red Auerbach, the, the, the general manager of the Celtics, he used to, he used to turn off the air conditioning in, in, the, in, the, in the visiting team's locker room to make them tired. Like, it was, a, it was, it was so awful in there, right? They had uh, up on the balconies, like, so let's just say that the, the seats went up to, like, this brown wood. And then where the white starts, that's the second balcony, you know, the, the balcony, right? So on the, on the wall, on the ceiling of this one, and then, of course, on the floor of that, there was a, there was a section where they could put signs, you know? And it would say, there were big red signs, with white writing, it said, no smoking. And by the third quarter, you couldn't see the no smoking sign over there because the place is so filled with smoke because everyone smoked indoors back then. It was like the, it was the most disgusting place ever. And the same stinky, no teeth peanut vendor was out there with an old busted up cart right in front of the door. All these, I mean, it's just a, it was awesome. I loved it there. It was awesome. And then they tore it down and they built this, 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 Las Vegas looking TD Waterhouse thing and I'll never step foot in that house of hell because uh, they got rid of my Boston Garden. But uh, anyway, so nowadays they have these skyboxes and all the, the privileged folks, they sit up there. And see what the Bible says is that because we're united with Christ, uh, he, he raised us from the dead, so you know, we're saved and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Now, now, now what, 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 is, what does that mean? I, I would challenge you to do this. If you have your Bible open, look back at, at chapter 1, verse 20. And it'll tell you where Jesus is seated. See, in, in 120 it says, uh, Christ was raised from the dead, and God the Father seated him in the place of honor at the Father's right hand in the heavenly realm. So, so if we could picture for a moment uh, with your imagination the throne room of God. I know we can't exactly envision it, but if you can envision the throne room of God at the right hand of the Father, this, this majestic on high that, that nobody could see and live, right? This one is on his throne, and to the right hand of him is Jesus Christ. And the Bible, now it says that. Now can you all agree with that? You see that, right? That makes sense. He's Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But what the Scripture says is that you who are united with Christ are seated with him right there, right now. See, a lot of us think that salvation is for, is for later. Like, I'm saved, but it's going to be good later on. Someday I'm going I'm to be with God, and I'm going to be in heaven. But the Bible teaches us that right now he is seated. Yeah, that's past tense, isn't it? There's no mistakes in the Bible, right? Is there any mistakes in the Bible? 
Who thinks there's mistakes in the Bible? I don't think there's any mistakes in the Bible. And it says right here that he has seated you with Christ in the heavenly realm. So you, right now, if you said yes to Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father on high in heaven right now. See, that, I'm trying to give you a new reality. That is true. See it with your mind's eye. That's what it says. That's true. It says here that we were once dead. It, we read it. It says, um, it says that... Um, we're, we're, I'm trying to read where, where it says it. Oh, yeah, Once, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Colossians 1, 21 through 22 says, you used to be far away. You were his enemies. You were separated. You were dead because of your many sins. You read on in Colossians chapter 1, it says, but because of Christ, listen up, listen. Because of Christ's bodily death on the cross, he has brought you into his presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. Now, think of the wording. The Bible's true. Because of Christ's death on the cross, because you united with him, he has brought you into his presence. Is that for a future time? When is that? Right now. As a matter of fact, I would, I would offer this. It's past tense. It's already happened. It's already happened. When you said yes, he has placed you at that moment in the heavenly realms with Jesus to the right hand of the Father. That's who you are right now. Right now. And see, the Bible tells us that we have been given his spirit and we have been given his mind. And so I know this is a stretch. It's hard to, because we can't see it, but I challenge you to close your eyes and see it. He's given you the mind of Christ. And I say that because I, I, I know you can grasp this. It's not a stretch. If the Bible is true, and I believe it is, I'm staking my eternity on it, then the truth is you can get this. You can make this the reality of your life, and you can start living accordingly right now. Let me ask you a question. How much trouble can the devil himself do in the throne room? Okay, you're back in the throne room now, right? Your head should be down. <laughs> you're in the throne room of God. The devouring fire. How much trouble can the devil do in the throne room of the Almighty? None. Unless you let him. Now, he has given you the mind of Christ, and you don't have to let him. You don't have to let him. The reality is that you're not some pauper down here on earth just trying to get by till one day, gloriously, you'll take your last breath. Bring it on, Jesus, right? No. Right now, you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Just as true as thou shalt not steal, that is true. The only way that this is going to happen, that this reality becomes the practice and exercise of your life, is if you do as the Bible says in Colossians, to let your roots grow down deep into him and let your life be built upon him. It's the only way it's going to happen. It says, then your faith will grow strong in the truth and you'll overflow with thankfulness. Now in that state, there's not a whole lot of room for the devil to mess with you, is there? Let's be honest. We're talking throne room. Throne room of God. He can't do a whole lot there. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Can you see it? Can you see it? I can see it. I can see you guys sitting right there with me. It's awesome. Now it's going to bring us to the next one. So I'm going to do, um, chronologically I'm going to mess it up and I'm going to go the fifth thing for the fourth. And we'll come back to the fourth thing for the fifth in just a moment. So here's the fourth thing in our list. Look at chapter 2, verse 13. 2.13 says this, But now 
You have been united with Christ, right? See, we can't tell you about 12 unless you saw that in 13. What's the promise of 12? The promise of 12 is actually a rebuke and a a plea to those that have not become united in Christ. He says, you lived in this world without God and without hope, but now you've been united with Christ. So what does that mean? Now you have hope, right? That's the next thing. Now you have hope. You have hope. You have hope. I talked about this a couple weeks ago. It's like the football team. If you have a, every football every every season that starts, every single city says, uh, "We're going all the way. We're going all the way." We all have hope, right? But that's not hope. That's a wish. That's blowing candles out on a cake. Because if your team stinks and you have no good players, you got no hope. But if you got a team that's got some good players on it and some good coaching, well, maybe you got a hope. Because a hope is not just blowing out candles on a, ke- on a cake. A hope is a confident expectation of a better future. Hope is a reason. you got to have a reason to believe it. It's not just, hey, I think it's going to be nice out. You know, three weeks from now, we go on our vacation. I, who knows? I have no idea what's going to happen. I can, ho- I, can, I, can, I can blow candles on a cake, and I can f- do my fingers crossed, and I can, ooh, I can... But hope is a confident expectation. It's a real reason to believe. And so what this says here is because you're united with Christ, you have a hope that, 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 that it's going to get better. And so whether you're young or old, whether, uh, whether it's going to get better here in this lifetime because you have lots of time left, I don't know. Or maybe you're older and you don't have a whole lot of time left. But we've got to start changing our reality from the things that we see because the things that we see are the things right here. But the things of eternity, they last forever. And so the, the hope is that even though you might only live another week here, it's still going to get better. And we have reason to believe that it would. You've got to have a new reality. In John eleven twenty five 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. That's a good place for an amen. Because I got news for you. You're all going to die. And I am too. But if you're united with Christ, you won't. Even if you do. Don't ask me to explain that. John 14, 1 through 4 says this. uh, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus said. I'm preparing a place and glory for you so you can be with me. And I'm going to come back and get you and I'm going to take you there with me. And we're going to hang out forever. That's confident hope. Revelation 21, he says, I'm going to wipe away every tear. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All these things gone forever. I'm making all things new. Ah, soak in that for a minute, huh? And listen, when you, when you read these, these are all promises I just read you. Like, you're going to, even if you die, you're not going to. I'm going to, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to come back and get you and bring you there. I'm going to wipe away your tears and take away your death and take away crying and sorrow and pain. And these are all promises of God. And the reason why we can have confident expectation of a greater hope, of a greater tomorrow, is because when we take all these promises, and that's just a couple of them, and we lay them all down. We turn around, we look at the, the, the past, and we look at all the times that, that God delivered, and we prayed and he answered, and we needed provision and it came, and we prayed for someone and they got saved. And someone was sick and we prayed and they got healed. We, 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 we lay before all these, prom- we lay these promises out. We, go, look, we look at all the deliveries of God, all the time that he came through. And we can go, hey, I can be confident in this God. I can believe in him. I can believe that when he says, I'm going to prepare a place and I'm going to come back and get you, I can believe it. Because there was a day that I was behind the dealership and I was praying to God and I said, Lord, I am so broke, I am so broken, and I can't even pay my my cell phone bill. I'm a terrible father, a terrible husband. I can't provide. And 20 minutes later, someone calls me and says, can you come to my office? We have $800 for you. Like, why? I don't know. Because it's just who God is. 
I don't know. But when I look back at that, I have confident expectation that this promise of even though I die, I live. I can believe it. So I have confident hope for better tomorrow. And of course we have confident expectation because since Christ went to the grave and he died and he rose again and he'll never die again, well, we're seated with him. And if he can't die, guess what? You can't either. We're co-heirs with Christ. All that he inherits is yours. This is reality, man. It's reality. We have hope, right? Here's the last thing for tonight. Look in 2.7. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. It's this unsearchable unbelievable, unexplainable, indescribable wealth of His grace and kindness poured out upon you who are in Christ. Provision when it's needed. Answered prayers. Prodigals returning. Relationships restored health being restored. Dude, I used to live in my car. I lived in a little Nissan Sentra at a lake in Massachusetts in the winter. And I'm six foot tall. Yeah, it wasn't fun. And sometimes I go home to my house and I look at my humble home. It's a little 1,483 square foot cookie cutter. And to some, they might think that that's just a nothing. To me, I honestly, I, I, sometimes I walk up and like I did the other night, I stopped and I'm looking at my house and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. I, you know, stains and all. I can't believe I live here. It's insane. I have six children, two grandchildren. One's still in the belly. I have the priv- this is a privilege to, to pastor a, a church and to care and shepherd your souls. And, and I get to be front seat to what God does in your life and, and front seat to what God's doing in our church like this last couple of weeks with this, I mean, this n- insanity. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I get to see all that. wrote it. <laughs> um, but it's the forgiveness of my Everest of sin. I'm, I'm, I'm naughty. I'm so naughty. <laughs> and every single night, even though I'm naughty, <clears throat> I've done so much, uh, I get to come in here. I get to sing songs, which is cool. I like to sing songs. But the truth of it is, is that it's Zephaniah, I think it's 317 or something. It says that God rejoices over me with song. I baptized my wife. I got to baptize Adriana. Jameson what, three, four weeks ago, riding home on my shoulders from Mimi's house, asked Jesus to be her Lord and Savior. So no doubt I'll be dunking her soon, man. And with my mountain of sins, all that I've done, God has privileged me, and I can't, des- I can't describe it in any other way. He has privileged me with being able to, not that it's everything, but I've, I've, I've baptized over a 
150 people in this church. To be a part of someone's eternity. No. Praise the Lord, not me. So, I, you know, I... I <clears throat> I'm very much aware of his incredible grace and kindness shown to me. But what about your list? What about your list? <clears throat> what about your list of amazing, amazing grace and kindness that he's poured out on your life? I'm going to ask that the gentlemen who have volunteered to pass out communion to come and gather it and give it out now. And I want you to hold it in your hand and I want you to, we're going to dim the lights down quite a bit because this again is another time for you and Jesus alone. It's nothing to do with me or the band or anybody else next to you. It has nothing to do with your wife or your husband or your children or your boyfriend or girlfriend, although they may be part of that grace and that kindness and we should thank the Lord for that. You guys can go right ahead. We've been given as a gift from Jesus this communion. We've been given this grace as an opportunity to exercise and experience being united in a single entity with our Lord. To exercise this mysterious holy oneness that he so desperately desires for us to have with him and with one another. So I would ask you to take a few moments to think about your list. Think about his unbelievable wealth of grace and kindness toward you as shown in all he has done for you because you are united with Christ. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Lord Jesus, we are now going to thank you by exercising your gift that you gave us so we could experience this holy oneness Through your death on the cross, you have brought us into your very presence, holy, blameless, and without single fault, right now. And so we remember the death on the cross by taking now the bread that represents your body. take the cup represents your blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins Lord I thank you for I thank you for this reality check tonight I thank you Lord that the reality is more than what we can see we thank you Lord that reality tells us that we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies when we said yes to Christ. You loved us. 
You chose us, you adopted us, you freed us, and you forgave us of our sins. Sin no longer controls our actions, thoughts, words, or destiny. We are seated with you at the right hand of the Father, Lord Jesus, right now and forever. And we thank you for this reality. Now, Lord, I pray that you take the words that we all heard. I spoke, we heard, I heard them, they heard them. We all heard it, Lord. We heard your word spoken tonight. And we pray, Lord, right now that your spirit would dwell with us in a mighty way this week and constantly remind us of the things we heard. As we go back this week and, and check through our notes and check through the word, Lord, I pray that you would excite us, that your spirit would excite us for the things of God as we pursue you earnestly. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And if you agree with everything that I just prayed, let me hear an amen. 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 Love you guys. My soul longs for you, my soul longs for you, nothing else will do, nothing else will do, my soul longs for you, my soul longs for you, nothing else will do, nothing else, and I believe. 